what's happening, Elevate Church? Okay, so someone told me, they're like, hey, you know, so the 8 o'clock was really loud and responds a lot, but just be, I just want you to know that the 10 o'clock service, not so much. I'm like, wow, that's not the 10 o'clock that it's here today, man. You guys are on it. So I, I so much love your pastors. They're so great. If you guys love, you guys love Pastor Mauricio? Yeah. Um, so, um, one quick story about him. Okay, so recently, like, you know, um, he was, uh, had this thing where he was doing, like, where he needed some business advice. And so, I don't know what it is, but, like, every pastor that I know um, thinks, like, I'm their, like, business advisor. So, uh, he, he calls me and said, hey, um, so, like, I, uh, we have this uh, business deal, and I told these people I have this business advisor, and it's you. And... Uh, <laughs> I said, okay, well, when's the call? He said, oh, in like five minutes. And I said, uh, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and I also love how you guys love sports here. Oh, my gosh, that's so cool. So cool. So, um, yeah, so in the first service, he said, can you remember your best uh, sporting uh, memory? And so it was like really quick for me because it was 1988 in the World Series, bottom of the ninth, Two outs, Kirk Gibson up to the plate, the Dodgers down three to two, the count three and, three and two, and Kirk Gibson with a basically like a broken leg hit a home run, and the Dodgers won the World Series. So some of you guys probably don't remember if you're millennials, but uh, you remember Gilbert, right? You probably remember. And so uh, my wife, uh, Janet, and my daughter, Nicole, are in the front row. You guys maybe stand up. Come on. My, my queen... The queen and the princess. And so, um, and then also uh, Gilbert and Dory Vasquez are like like family for Jen and I. We've known them for at least 25 years. We all both grew up in the same church. Um, and so uh, you guys have some great, spectacular people at Elevate Church. Some really good people. So I'm going to get rid of this book. So, hey, I brought some of my books and um, I, I don't know if this one is. Well, it's not. But um, so I signed a bunch of books uh, yesterday for you guys. And so uh, for a donation of any amount, I mean any amount, you can get a signed book. And 100% of the money and more goes to Life Impact, which is one of, uh, it's actually uh, Gilbert's, it's her niece, right? Gilbert's niece, who's a combination of Mother Teresa and Indiana Jones. Okay, so <laughs> she literally rescues children. So 100% of whatever you give, 100% of the offering, anything that I get, 100% and more will go to Life Impact and to rescuing children. And so then um, uh, if you guys also want to check out some of my stuff, it's at thriveteaching.org. And I have a bunch of stuff for Marketplace, Workplace Ministries, um, a bunch of different resources. You could actually download my book for free on the website. And so uh, if you go there and also if you want to follow me, I don't even know. What, what, what's my thing, Nicole? I, I don't even know. Okay, so... Like, uh, it's, uh, you, like, if you want to follow me on my MySpace page, please. Uh, so, I'm so bad at the social media stuff. I just, like, but um, I'm something, and you can see it in the back, okay? So. Thrive underscore teaching, just like I said. Thanks, man. So, um, so, hey, if you read my bio, it says that I have been an entrepreneur since the age of 13. And what it was from the age of 13, I was a drug dealer. And so, but it's cool. I, I, I don't do it anymore. It's been like over a week since I quit. But uh, no, uh, so um, what happened was every male role model I had was a drug dealer. And now what's cool is that like every male role model I have is like a mighty man of God. And so... Um, and, you know, like, I hadn't even recognized it. And my wife had said to me, she's like, you are a father to so many people now. And I was like, wow, how does God, God is so supernatural. Like, he'll take people that grew up with no dads and give them fathers of the faith. And then they get to be fathers of the faith, too. So, um, 
So every male role model I had was a drug dealer, and that kind of lifestyle continued till I was in my mid-20s, till I met this beautiful woman in the front row, and she was a backslidden Christian, and um, she, I actually used to sell her drugs, and so, um, uh, which it just worked out for us. I don't know how it did, okay? It just worked out, okay? So she's writing a book right now called I Brought My, uh, called I Brought My Drug Dealer to Church, and so... Um, You guys are better than the first service already, okay? <laughs> Come on, game on, 12 o'clock. So, um, so Janet um, starts talking about getting her life right with God, and she takes, uh, she says, uh, ask me to go with. And so she takes me to this little church. And so now um, my very first time ever being in a church, first time. After the service, she drags me up to the front. There's a little woman there, and the little woman says this, Say this prayer and repeat it after me. Super simple. God, come in my life. And take the things out that you want out and put the things in that you want in, in Jesus' name. Really simple, right? Well, the next day, a very exciting thing happened as my house got raided by the police. <laughs> Be very careful for what you pray for. It might just happen. I'm in jail that night. And uh, which it happens, right? You know, um, and I cried out to God, and I'm like, I was the unchurched, you guys, I'm totally unchurched. I cried out to God, God, how could you do this? I just prayed and gave you my life. And it was really the first time I sensed God speaking to me, and I could really remember it, just like Kirk Gibson's home run, where God spoke to me and said, "I did this for you. I have a new plan for your life," and that was 28 years ago. Amen. So. Um, Okay, so, um, so Janet saw, okay, we're Christians now. We have to find a church. And so uh, she, we went around to some uh, local churches, and, and afterwards she's like, hey, um, do these people seem uh, a little strange to you? And I'm like, yeah, in comparison to the people I know, right? <laughs> and she's all, no, this la those ladies over there, their hair, it's really super long. It's like, you know, uh, will you go ask one of the ladies why their hair is so long? Sure. Excuse me, miss, why is your hair, and this is a true story, okay? This is all, what makes this, I don't know if it's funny, but, but I know it's powerful because it's 100% true, right? So she, uh, I go and talk to this lady, and I say, excuse me, but um, why is your hair so long? She said, here at our church, we don't believe in cutting your hair. And since my wife is a hairdresser, we knew we were in the wrong church, right? <laughs> They would have been like, she's a harlot. <laughs> and I remember the next week, just like the Kirk Gibson home run. As we held hands and prayed in my truck, God, send us to the church you want to go, us to be at. And the next week, we went to this little church in Simi Valley. We were there for 18 years, and it was the perfect place for us. The perfect place. As the church had this a uh, huge ministry to ex-gangbangers and to drug addicts, and we are in the, uh, in the perfect place. And I want to share with you, you are in the perfect place. Amen. You are in the place you should, because uh, you have a great pastor here. And, a great, and, you know, I got to meet a lot of the team, and you've got a great team here that super loves you, super loves you here. <laughs> um, so, um. We started going to this little church, Janet, and I got married, and she's like, um, you know, uh, I was at the time, I was repairing drywall, and Janet um, was assisting girls cutting hair. We just got married, and um, we had two small kids, and so I put together our budget, and um, I, I presented it to Janet. I said, here's our budget, and she said, does it include tithing? I said, uh, no, I'm sorry, but we won't be able to afford to tithe, and she said, Mike, all Christians tithe. <laughs> it was seven years till I figure out she duped me. <laughs> but by then, I already had, had an experience with God as it relates to finances. Okay, so our first year of marriage, right? Our first year. 
You know, I'm not telling you, and I got to say this the right way because I'm going to get it. I'm just going to tell you guys, please pray for me because after today, I will be in trouble. <laughs> okay, so our first year of marriage, we went without car insurance. So I'm not telling you to not have car insurance. What I'm telling you is I was driving my pickup truck, this little Toyota pickup truck in San Fernando Valley. I made a right turn in front of a big truck and I was holding on to the wheel waiting for the truck to hit me. And it was like an angel of God picked my truck up and moved it. I'm not saying to not have car insurance. I could just tell you that tithing has been the best insurance we've ever had. Our second year of marriage, um, so, um, and we're, we're, we're kind of independent, you know, like she had her little uh, business and I had my little business, right? And so um, we were out to lunch at a really super nice, expensive uh, Mexican restaurant. Uh, maybe some of you guys have heard of it. It's called Del Taco. <laughs> our, we went to Del Taco so many times, our kids hate that place. <laughs> okay, just driving by it, I think like my daughter's going to throw like firebomb it or something, right? You know, because we went there so, I mean, we're broke, okay, you know? And we also had a heart for the young people at our church. And we used to take as many young people as we can, and actually could feed 10 people for 20 bucks, you know? And so we were at Del Taco, and Janet mentioned to me, she said, Mike, did you tithe this week? And I said, yes, I did. And um, she said, oh, no, I tithed, and I tithed off your income. I said, oh, no, I tithed, and I tithed off your income. We had done it accidentally for three weeks in a row. And since neither one of us wanted to call our pastor and ask for a refund, <laughs> the thought did cross our mind. I just want to let you know. It did. We said, you know what? We're just going to go with it. We're just going to go with it. And that was the first year that our income doubled. And let me just tell you, the word of God works. The word of God works. And if you put it into practice, it doesn't matter what's happened in your past. Like Janet sometimes says, I'm like God's experiment. I'm going to take somebody with no experience, with no education, with no resources, and really no skills. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Our company is the largest apartment contractor for remodeling apartments in the state of California. And I barely could screw in a light bulb. God has a sense of humor. God's got a sense of humor. And, and let me just tell you, if you take the word of God, all I did was take the word of God and put it into practice. What our pastor taught on Sunday, we would just take and put it into practice on Monday. Okay, so uh, uh, the title for today um, in your finale series on going beyond, what a cool series, what a cool title is changing the atmosphere. And I want to talk today with you guys about changing the atmosphere. So let me tell you what's going on at the time. Jesus has preached a bunch of messages in a bunch of big towns. And uh, he's talking to the disciples about going over to the other side where there's fewer towns, there's actually no towns. And, um, and geographically, the location is the Sea of Galilee. And um, on, in the Sea of Galilee, on all sides of the Sea of Galilee are mountains. And when there's these kind of mountains like that around a big body of water, that becomes susceptible to storms, okay? So they are about ready to venture out into this lake, this sea, that is susceptible to storms. So it's not uncommon might be something like in our lives, right? Where we're just in this time where, you know, like there's a bunch of storms in our life, but we're going through something that makes us susceptible to storms. I mean, it could be like a, a, an issue uh, with, a, um, with a child. It could be some kind of issue with your job. It could be some kind of issue with your marriage, or it could be anything that makes you susceptible to storms. And you know what, um, with this, um, well, that was awkward, but uh, um, so uh, now I feel like I'm at my home church, because I do it every time at my home church. So I don't know where you're at, 
But if you're in an area um, of your life where you're susceptible to storms, it's okay. It's okay because just like this story, Jesus is in the boat and Jesus is in your boat. So um, Jesus calms the storm, and this is uh, ch uh, the title is Changing the Atmosphere. And that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and it's like a big storm came up. And the waves broke over the boat, and so it was nearly swamped. And where's Jesus? Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, and all hell is breaking loose. So that tells us one thing. Sometimes when all hell breaks loose, we just need to pull away and take some rest. Because even Jesus needed rest. Sometimes when all hell breaks loose, sometimes we just need to take a chill pill. Teacher, don't you care? If we drown, that's what they said to Jesus. And so I have a scripture for, uh, for somebody, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. It says, cast your care upon him, for he cares about you. In the message translation, it says, he cares what happens to you. Jesus cares. He got up, re rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the w wind died down, and it was completely calm. He completely, Jesus completely Change the atmosphere. He said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is he? Who is Jesus? He is the son of God. He is the son of the alpha and omega and the beginning of, and the end. God all, he is the son of God almighty. He's infinite all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, unchangeable Jehovah. So um, a friend of ours that lives on the East Coast, and so he lives in an area that's susceptible uh, to hurricanes. So um, there was this hurricane a couple years ago, and it was really, really bad. And I called him up on the phone, and I said, hey, um, there's this hurricane coming and uh, he's like, yeah, uh, thanks for telling me that, Captain Obvious, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what are you guys going to do? Are you guys going to evacuate? He said, no, me and a bunch of my friends have got together, and we are praying, and we are speaking to the storm. And I thought to myself, the man of faith, you might want to evacuate. <laughs> and he's like, no, we're staying, and we're speaking to the storm. Me, him and a group of his friends. So the storm starts to come towards him, and it's a level five. It gets about 200 miles, and it turns to a level four. 100 miles, it's a level three. By 50 miles, it's a level one. By the time it hit him, all they did was get wet. Amen. And so um, we could speak to the storms in our lives. We could speak to the storms in our life. So... Um, First, a point I, want, I would like to make is uh, um, we have the authority and the power and the ability to speak to the storms of our life. And when we do, we could go far beyond wherever we are today and wherever we even believe that we could get to. Acts 10.38. So we have authority, but we're not the authority. Do you get, understand what I'm saying? We have authority. And our authority is in Christ. We are not the authority. He's the power. And as we plug into him, then that's how we access the power. Uh, Acts 10.38, it says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So that same power that's on Jesus is on you because he lives inside you. I love it. Ephesians 3.20 about going beyond, right? Going beyond. Now he who is able to do far more than we ever imagine or think according to his power that works. It's his power that works in us. Okay, so um, 
I have these um, uh, these friends, right? And uh, he was telling me about um, you know him and his wife arguing, right? And it's one of my Christian friends, right? And he's talking about it, but he puts it in this way, like you know, my wife and I, you know, like sometimes we have Christian arguments, and I'm like. <laughs> My wife and I brawl, okay? Uh, uh. And I, like talking to him, I felt like I wasn't even Christian, right? You know, because <laughs> he's just talking about how like nice it is and stuff like that. And I'm like, gosh, you know, what is wrong? And uh, so and then he told me that like they were in what he called um, an argument, you know, like he said he walked outside and he prayed like this, in the name of Jesus, I bind you devil off my marriage and out, off my home. In Jesus' name, right? And he said it worked. So, you know, like being a student, like I am, kind of, whatever, you know. <laughs> Jan and I were, were in this, like, uh, and, and let me just tell you, it's not, you know, like, like um, it's not like, uh, I want to say this the right way. So it's not that I'm for guns or against guns, right? It's we don't have any guns because I'm afraid one of us might kill each other, okay? <laughs> we don't even have any sharp knives. One of our friends says, hey, you guys have no sharp knives. I'm like, by design. <laughs> so we were having a Christian argument, a.k.a. brawl. And I walked outside, and I'm like, in the name of Jesus, I command you to uh, leave my house and my marriage and my home in Jesus' name. And I came in, and she's like this, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, it totally worked. <laughs> hasn't worked every time, <laughs> but it worked that one time. You can change your words, can change the atmosphere Amen. of your home, of your family, in every area of your life. Uh, Proverbs 18.20, it says, from the fruit of the mouth, a person's stomach is filled with the harvest of their lips. They are satisfied. Romans 12.18, I love this scripture. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. James 3.16, James 3, for where there is strife and, and envy, every evil exists. So um, I got this phone call uh, about one of our jobs in Northern California. And so um, what happened was it was just... Oh, just a bad time and you know the job had been bid like three or four years prior and the job started and prices went skyrocket in Northern California and so um, one of the subcontractors is in a lot of trouble because the pricing uh, for labor and material has gone up by 40 percent he's just in trouble okay so he's not able to do his job and my company, who's the general contractor, is fighting with him because he's not able to do the job. The owner, the developer, is fighting with us because the subcontractor is not able to do their job, so nobody else is able to do their job. And everybody's fighting, and the job is almost stopped. So I got this phone call, and I'm like, you know, I don't know what to do. Prices have gone up. I can't really fix it. There's nothing I could do. So, you know, like... um. And, like, I just started praying, you guys, and not to be religious because I was literally desperate. And so I, as I was praying, I really felt like the Lord said, you need to change the atmosphere there. You need to change the equation and the conversation. So I went to Northern California, and I started uh, talking to my guys uh, that were managing the job. And they said to me, they go, you need to tell him to do his job. I said, listen, if he doesn't have the money, you, you know, whatever I tell him, it's not going to work. And they're like, well, you need, we shouldn't make him do his job. And I said, we can't make him do his job. And I said, we're going to change the conversation. This guy is in trouble, and we don't kick people when they're down. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to help him. We're going to do everything we possibly can do to help him finish his job. If he needs material, get him material. If he needs labor, give him labor. Because if he fails, we fail. So um, my, uh, my staff is like, okay, we'll change the conversation. So then I went and met with the subcontractor, and he was so angry and so mad and so difficult. And, you know, like he was just yelling at me, and I'm really not that guy, okay? Like, you hit me, I'll hit you back, okay? And um, so, 
it's just the truth. I'm not, I'm not quite as Christian as the guy in the front row here. Okay. <laughs> he's so nice. You know, like I told him, he's like, I like the Lakers. I'm like, I like the Clippers. I, I thought he was going to knock me out, but um, <laughs> it's all good. Love you, man. So, um, so he's yelling at me, right? And, and I just so really, I go like this. I go, um, I'm, I go, I'm sorry. He yelled at me some more. And I go, I understand. And he, his voice went down a little bit. And then he said it like a third time. And I go, I totally understand. And then his voice went down a little bit. And then finally I said, I'm here to help. I want to help you. And he completely calmed down. And I told him how we were going to work with them in order to get the job completed. And we were going to help them and do everything we could, you know, and to get the job totally completed. So um, I fly back home. And I get a call from the owner. And the owner asked me, he said, hey, listen, did you go to a class? Because I went to a class 10 years ago. The owner's told me about himself going to a class 10 years ago on construction, production, efficiency. And I'm like, no, I never went to a class like that. He goes, you have to have. Everything I learned in that class happened the day after you left. And I said, no, I didn't. I, I didn't even, I've never been to that class. He said, what did you do? Because the production on the job has gone up by 40%. What did you do? I said, I just went there and changed the atmosphere. See, when you change the atmosphere, everything comes into perfect order. Amen. Worship changes the atmosphere. Worship and the literal brings on the presence of God in your life in your home, in your job, that will literally take things and shake it upside down. Okay, so I was, um, I went and met, um, I was a guy that like got to pick the guy up uh, that was speaking at the church, this was probably 20 years ago or so, and when I did, I went into his hotel room and it was so anointed, and it was just like he had worship music going, right? And um, it was so anointed. Um, that I found out what, um, what songs he had, right? And I got a copy of that CD that he had. And um, I just loved it. So I started, and I asked him, and he said he played the worship music all the time. So I started playing the worship music um, that he had um, in my private office, right? And I started doing it probably about 17 or 18 years ago. Uh, um, for, uh, I've had the same song, one song. My daughter knows it. She told me that she will hear that in her sleep till the day she dies. <laughs> so the same song, Holy Spirit Come by Rita Springer, playing 24 hours a day, 365 days a year in my private office. It's like, it's like background noise for me. I can't even hear it, right? And this is also the office that I spend about six hours a week in prayer and praying for the people um, that I work with. Okay, so... Um, and I just felt like it was part of my job to do that. And so um, uh, we got the opportunity to work with a union in Southern California. So one of the union heads, it's in this guy's in charge of 10,000 people. He came to my office to make a deal with us. And our conference room was full. So my vice president said, hey, it's going to be five more minutes. Can you take the union head into your private office? And this is a place where there is an atmosphere of worship going 24 hours a day. He comes into my private office. He sits down. And within 30 seconds, he's crying, right? And um, he goes like this to me. He goes, are you, are you some kind of Christian or something? <laughs> and I'm like, well, some kind. <laughs> and, he, and he said, six weeks ago, I had a heart attack. Today is my first day, day back to work. Will you pray for me? And so I just... I, he raised his hands. I just prayed for him. I got him a bunch of scriptures on healing. I had a bunch of scripture cards. I just grabbed them and gave them to him on healing. He comes into our main conference room with all these scripture cards. And my whole staff goes, how did you convert him that fast? <laughs> I didn't do it. It was the atmosphere. When people come, that's why you need to bring people to church. It's because when they come into this atmosphere, literally the chains around their body will fall off. Everything happens in an atmosphere. Everything happens 
in the right atmosphere. Okay, so the uh, union guy introduces me to this developer that's like uh, this really well-known developer. I met him at like this uh, a hotel called the W or something like that. And so um, we met there and then he decided to come to my office afterwards. So he comes to my private office. He sits down and within 30 seconds, he's in tears. And I'm like, okay, here we go. <laughs> Never got a job from this guy, but I did lead him to the Lord, okay? <laughs> True. Huh? <laughs> okay, so um, he raises his hands and he accepts Jesus in my office. It's happened more than a hundred times, and so um, and I don't have a Bible on my desk. I don't even have a bumper sticker on my car, mostly because my driving is not Christian. Okay, <laughs> true fact, hundred percent true. Like, they have this saying, they're like, he's never been in an accident, but there's no way we could tell how many accidents he's caused. <laughs> you know, like, sometimes I just, like, switch lanes, right? Four at one time. Okay. You know, my daughter's on one lane at a time. I'm like, I didn't see any cars, you know. Okay, so the union, uh, so the developer raises his hands and accepts Jesus. And as the story goes, and he told me the story two years later, he went to my assistant's office and said, I have to get a copy of whatever's playing in that, in that office. Whatever it is, I got to get a copy of it. So my assistant burned him a CD. And this guy's got like this $200,000 Porsche. He couldn't get the CD to work in the Porsche. <laughs> he took the Porsche to the Porsche dealer and said, I'm not leaving till I get this music playing in my car because there's something supernatural about it. Um, as uh, the band comes up for me. Thank you, guys. Such an honor to be here. I, I, I really, truly uh, love your pastors. And now, you know, like I was here just, I was here when you guys first opened. Um, I, think I, I, I think I might have put this stage in. I don't remember. It's been a long time. So, um, so uh, prayer changes everything, you guys. Prayer changes everything. Psalms 133.1. 1. The heartfelt continued and persistent prayer of a righteous man, a believer, can accomplish much. You can go. Prayer will bring you beyond where you're at today and ever even thought you could be. Can accomplish much when put into action and made effective by God. You know, you could go beyond not just because of what you do, not because of what you do, it's because of who you're connected to. It is dynamic and has tremendous power. Prayer is like dynamite. It's dynamic and it's working. And, and I, I want to talk, um, uh, before I conclude, about one to specific prayer, a kind of prayer, and that's between a husband and a wife together in unity. And um, in Psalms 133, 1, it says, Oh, how good it is when brothers pray in unity or dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commands a blessing. And I don't know what it is, you know, with Jan and I. I, I don't know. Like, we know that we've had times where we've sat down and prayed together and we've see, seen supernatural miracles, Right? And then we've had times that we just didn't and let, uh, pray together and we didn't see the miracles. I don't know what, we know it. We know it. We know in our heart and I don't know what it is. I don't, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know what it is. I mean, sometimes we'll get together and we're going to pray and you know, you know, the dog just starts barking, right? And it's like, I'll get, you know, like put him out or the cat, the dog's chasing the cat, you know, and I don't know. And then, you know, like, or I'll get a phone call from work. And, you know, like, I'll stop and, like, you know, then we'll go a different way. Or, or she'll, ha she'll say, hey, I just want to text one person. And she's like this texter like this, like one finger. It's some texts take like 17 minutes. Pray for me. I'm going to be in trouble. But uh, 
But I can tell you this, when we pray together, the supernatural of God happens. And when you pray with your spouse, the supernatural of God will happen with you. And literally what happens is the angels of God move forward and move out and do exactly what you pray when you and your spouse pray together. So um, uh, I think it was like 12 years ago. And so um, Jan and I were like not in a good spot, you know. And, um, and so, but we, uh, but uh, during this time, like uh, we found out that our daughter uh, was um, on drugs. And I'm not talking about smoking marijuana or drinking, she was on heroin. And like then we couldn't find her, and we didn't know where she was. You know what I mean? And like we were arguing at the time about something, and who knows what it was. But we got together because her life was at stake. And we said, you know what? Who cares? And we got together, and we started to pray. And we didn't just pr uh, pray, but we declared the word of God over our life. Nicole will live and not die, and to proclaim the goodness of God. Nicole, who the sun sets free, is free indeed. We couldn't find her, and she had run off with, you know, like, she was away with, you know, doing, and we couldn't even find her, and she was away with this guy, with this guy that literally had been in jail with, for murder, okay? And we, we didn't know where she was, and, and, and I remember Janet and I, we got together and we prayed. Janet actually put pictures of Nicole all over our house uh, of Nicole worshiping God. And so, um, and so a bunch of things happened, and, um, um, and we were praying. But I'll tell you, she's here today. She's, uh, she's been sober 12 years, and God totally set her free. And so, 